John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And the King James text today reads in this fashion. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Amen. I'm talking to us today on the topic, not at all as I expected. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, Savior, Redeemer, lover of lost men, we come before you now, God, as the word of the Lord would go forth. And your messenger needs strength. I need the anointing. I need a touch from God. Lord, so that I might deliver the word of the Lord to the people of God. I can't possibly do it on my own. The word of God promises they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like his eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And Master, today, right now, I claim the promise of your word as I do your bidding and do that, O oh Master, for which I have been called. Anoint the messenger of God, but more importantly, anoint the ear of every hearer. Allow the heart, the mind, the soul, the spirit of every individual that would hear this message to discern in truth that it is a word from God for them at this hour. Help them to receive it, Lord, that it might become the engrafted word. And Lord, that it might be a seed of faith which will sprout roots and grow up, O oh, Master, today into a mighty, mighty plant which will bring you glory and honor. We ask all this today and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ had a little meeting with a fellow at the pool of Bethesda. This man was there for a reason. There was something of a tradition, if you want to call it a tradition, which God himself had ordained. And that tradition, as it were, uh, amounted to an angel occasionally coming down from heaven and disturbing the water at the pool of Bethesda. And as those who were sitting around the outside porches of the pool, the decking as it were, if they would keep their eye on that water, and if they happened to be the first one to see that the water had been troubled, and they were able to quickly make their way in to the pool, 
they would find a healing or a deliverance or the miracle that they so desperately needed in their life and in their body. This particular day, the God who commanded the angel to go to the pool and to disturb the water was himself walking by. Hallelujah. Oh, but this lame man who had for so many years been in this desperate condition did not recognize who it was that he was talking to. I want to tell you today, folks, sometimes we get so busy looking for our miracle to come in one fashion or another that we cannot see that miracle when it's standing right in front of us. And the reason is simply because God has chosen to do it in a different way. It is not at all as you had expected. I'm going to tell you, if I've learned anything from living for the Lord all these 56 years nearly, if I've learned anything from growing up in the Pentecostal church and seeing God perform miracles and seeing the Lord heal and deliver and save, if I've learned anything, I've learned this. Very seldom will God do things the way that you anticipate they're going to get done. Huh. Thinking about Tommy and I right now, we're waiting for a position for him to open up somewhere. And of course, he's got irons in the fire, you know. He's got, uh, he's got uh, calls in to this individual here. He's got this headhunter working for him there. He's got a friend of a friend who's trying to look for him elsewhere. He's got applications in all over the place. He's got this, that, and the other thing going on. And I'm going to tell you, if there's anything I've learned about God, God loves to go beyond above and beyond anything the word of God said unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think I'll tell you God has a way of going above and beyond and doing things in a way <laughs> and then we'll sit back and say well you know I never in a million years expected it to happen that way I was expecting this headhunter to come through for me I was expecting this uh, this uh, uh, resume I put out here to maybe work for me I was expecting maybe this lady was going to be able to help me or this man was going to be able to help me the man at the pool of Bethesda said I have no man to help me <laughs> and there in front of him stands Jesus the creator of the universe one who had healed the sick cleansed the leper raised the dead cast out devils but this man was still focused on the water because he still believed that's where his miracle would come. I'm going to tell you, a lot of us today are looking at the water. We have a preconceived idea. We have a preconceived notion as to how our miracle is going to come. We have it in our mind. It's going to happen like this or it's going to happen like that. I remember when Tammy Faye Baker, whom I love, so I'm not saying this in a critical or negative way at all concerning her. But when she was so sick with cancer, in the end, God had once touched her and she survived one bout with cancer, but then later it came upon her another time in another form and she was fighting for her life and she looked terrible, bless her heart. I always thought she was such a little doll and she looked awful. Her body was ravaged, not only by the cancer, but by the chemo and the treatment. And I remember Tammy saying, well, I went to see Brother Benny Hinn and have him pray for me. Well, of course, everybody expects these big names, these big preachers. 
preachers with these big ministries to be able to touch God for them. And I remember when she spoke those words, I remember literally thinking in my mind, Tammy, you're looking at the water. You think you know how you can get this thing. You think you know where you can go, come on now, to get the help you need. You think you know how God can work this. Oh, but girl, I'm here to tell you, one of the best things you probably could ever do would be get in your car and drive a few hundred miles till you get to some little town somewhere and find you a little Pentecostal church that's singing and worshiping and walk in and say, I need a miracle from the Lord. And if there aren't but 15 or 20 people in that congregation, I guarantee you, girl, that's where you'd find your miracle. Because you're looking where you think the miracle will come from. And I'm here to tell you today, that God often works in ways that we do not even begin to expect or anticipate. I have a great aunt. My aunt Geneva, my grandfather's oldest sister. I love this lady. You talk about an incredible Christian lady. Holy mackerel. Holy Ghost filled, on fire for God. Love the Lord with every ounce of her being. And way back... Way back in either, I think it might have been the 40s or the 50s. Might have been. I'm not exactly sure. She developed a cancer in her stomach. And the cancer literally ate through her stomach lining, ate through her skin, her muscle. And she literally had a hole in her flesh right about here. She was dying. They sent her home to die. They, had, they didn't have a lot of the treatments they have now. They didn't have a lot of the technology they have now. And they sent her home to die. And her sister was with her. And she was taking care of her and trying to tend to her needs and all this. And all of a sudden, one day, my Aunt Eleanor suddenly something clicked in her spirit and she realized something and she looked at Aunt Geneva and she said, Geneva, what in the world are we doing? What are we doing sitting here waiting for you to die when we serve the God of Pentecost? She said, we need to go get you prayed for there was a little Pentecostal church not too far down the street from them that they had never even visited, never been to. But my Aunt Eleanor said they could hear the people singing from that church, the old hymns of the church. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. And Aunt, Gen Aunt Eleanor looked at Aunt Geneva and said, why don't we go to that church across the way there and let them pray for you? So Aunt Eleanor and Aunt Geneva got their clothes together. They got ready, made their way across the road, walked down the block a little bit, walked into this little church that they had never even visited. She belonged to another church. She told the pastor, I've got cancer. The doctors have sent me home to die, but I believe God is a miracle working God. The pastor said, Sister, sit here on the altar. And they set her on the altar. And the people in that little church, not very many people, but they got around her and they began to pray for her. And they began to intercede for her. Oh, I mean to tell you, some of them begin to get in the Spirit. They begin to feel the Lord. They begin to feel victory. They begin to feel that God was in fact sending the answer. And they got a little happy. And they began to rejoice. And as the Spirit of the Lord was falling on them, it was falling on my Aunt Geneva. She went home that night. It didn't look like anything had changed. She went to sleep. 
The next morning she woke up and my Aunt Eleanor went in to help her change her dressing. And when she took the old bloody dressing off of that, her stomach was 100% healed. There was nothing there, no hole, no scar, no mark. She was entirely healed by the power of God. I've heard this story firsthand, so this isn't, this isn't secondhand, you know, thirdhand stuff. She called her doctor. She said, Doctor, I've been healed. God has healed me. The doctor thought she lost her mind. He thought because she was so close to death that she finally cracked, you know, that the pressure of what was happening and finally caused her to crack. He said, well, can you get to my office? He said, let's check you out and see what's going on. And he probably was thinking we might need to admit her and, you know, put her under what we would call today hospice care. Well, the doctor's office was about... I think she said about three miles away. And they said they didn't have a car readily available, so Geneva said, well, that's right, I'll walk. <laughs> a woman who just the day before had a hole in her stomach and could barely function, could barely move, said, I'll walk three miles to the doctor's office. So she walked to the doctor's office. And she told the doctor, I've been prayed for, and God touched me, and I've been healed. He said, well, let's see. And she lifted her dress and revealed her stomach and shocked the doctor. And he called in the nurses, and he was calling everybody in and saying, you won't believe this. You're not going to believe this. Brother Charles, what's the point of what you're talking about? The point is this. Geneva went into that meeting without any expectation because it wasn't like she had said to herself, I know how God's going to heal me. One day I'm going to go into a church and they're going to pray for me. I'm going to tell you, I've had thoughts like this myself. The enemy loves to plant thoughts in our mind of expectation. You say, well, pastor, that doesn't sound right. Seems like expecting God to move in your life and in your body and expecting God to give you a miracle whether you're expecting it this way or that way shouldn't matter the fact that you're expecting is a good thing no it's not always a good thing because oftentimes we begin to so strongly expect it to happen this way that when the miracle comes at us from another direction listen to me children we lose out on that miracle because it doesn't fit in with our expectation. Oh my goodness. I'm expecting one day that God is going to send me to a church somewhere and I'm going to go up and ask for prayer and He's going to heal me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And all of a sudden one day somebody comes into our church to visit and they hear of my current situation, my dilemma. And they say to me, Pastor, would you mind if I prayed for you? I believe God can heal you. And I say to them, well, okay, sure, you know, and I go along with it in motion. See, I'm going to tell you, God showed me many years ago. There's a lot of people, even in the Pentecostal, especially in the Pentecostal church, who will go through the motions, but their faith is not engaged. So because I'm expecting my miracle to come another way, I'm sitting here and I'm basically saying, all right, you go ahead and pray for me. And, you know, uh, but I, and in my mind I'm thinking, but I know God's going to do it another way. Do you follow what I'm saying? And therefore when they pray for me, I don't pray with any expectation of a miracle at that moment because I'm expecting it a different way. And I may forfeit a miracle because God may very well have sent that person in. I'm going to tell you a little secret, friend. The Bible teaches the gifts of the Spirit. 
Not everybody has all the gifts of the Spirit. The only human being that ever had every gift of the Spirit is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God said that the Lord dispenses these gifts according to His will and according to His purpose, but they're meant to operate within the body. They're not meant... Everybody in the church is not meant to have every gift. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But when you take the church collectively, you have Jesus in the midst of you because every gift should be in operation somewhere within the congregation. Growing up as a kid, there were certain men and women in the church that, honey, if you needed prayer and you needed a miracle, you knew where to go. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they had the gift of healings. They had the faith to believe God for healing. And that was something that was part of them, that God had literally, if you, if you will, installed and instilled in them. Now, if that person wasn't in the meeting that you went into for prayer... And they're the only person in the church. Now, I'm not saying they'd be the only person, but I'm saying if they're the only person in the church that has that gift, then you may not get that healing in that meeting. I'm going to tell you when I was pastoring my first church, and I kid you not when I say this. Everybody that this preacher prayed for and laid hands on for healing received their healing. My grandmother said this to my aunt one time. I had an aunt who had turned her back on the Pentecostal movement, had begun to attend a Baptist church, and this aunt was denying the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's a scary place to be, folks. She was denying divine healing. But one day, as my aunt was suffering great amount of pain, she had already lost two or three babies. She had had miscarriages. She already had three children. The doctors told her that her system would not be able to ever allow her to have another child, that if she ever became pregnant again, she would always miscarry. Well, she didn't want to do anything to prevent herself from having more children, so she kept having miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. This particular day, she was in the process of miscarrying yet again. And she was in tremendous pain. And she went to my grandmother's house so that she could just lay down and let the miscarriage happen. And without her having to tend to her husband and her children at home, she had three kids at home and, you know, and her husband. And this would allow her to kind of rest and just let the miscarriage play out. Well, I happened to go by my grandmother's house. I was pastoring my first church 35 years or so ago. No, more than that, my heaven. Anyway, I don't even want to remember now. But a long time ago, let's say it that way. And my grandmother was standing in the doorway to the kitchen. And the kitchen was just beyond the living room. And I entered through the living room and I saw my Aunt Faith on the pull-out sofa bed in the living room. And I said, Hi, Faye, you know, how are you? And she said, Not very good. And she was, she's in a lot of pain. And she said, I'm, I'm miscarrying this baby, you know. And I said, Oh, honey, I'm sorry. But see, I have a policy. I don't pray for anybody that don't ask for prayer. You say, Well, Pastor, you're just crazy. You just do things to be doing things. No, no, no. The Word of God said, Brethren, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint them with oil and lay hands on them and pray in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall raise him up. 
I think one of the most important elements in that passage is missed by too many churches and too many pastors. Growing up as a kid, preachers used to call people down to the altar. If you need prayer, come on down. If you need the Lord to touch you, come on down and we'll pray for you. Come on down. As if, you know, God was in the wholesale business. The problem is, miracles from God and answered prayer require faith. And faith requires action. Because faith without works, without action, is dead being alone. So God said in His Word, Is there any sick among you? Listen, let him call for the elders of the church. Before the elders lay hands on them, anoint them with oil, and lay hands on them and pray for them in the name of the Lord. Before all that happens, the Word of God said, let him, the sick, call for the elders of the church. What does that mean? That means the person who is sick needs to, listen to me, needs to exercise just enough faith to ask the elders to pray for them and anoint them with oil. Do you follow what I'm telling you? God's not asking for a lot of faith, but He's asking for some. Well, my grandmother was standing in the doorway, and as I entered the room and I spoke to Faith for a minute, Grandma's kind of like this, and I went in the kitchen, and she went a little deeper in the kitchen, and she whispered to me, Faith is having a miscarriage. This is her third or fourth miscarriage, you know. She's in a great deal of pain. She said, but she has agreed and ask you to pray for her. I looked at my grandmother a little suspiciously, you know, and I thought, oh, Grandma, are you sure? This is a girl who's denying the Pentecostal movement, who's denying divine healing, who's denying the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I said, are, are you sure she's asking? I said, you're not asking for her, she's asking. And Grandma said, no, no, she asked. So I went out into the living room and I said to my aunt, I said, Faye, Grandma tells me that you have asked for me to anoint you with oil and pray for you. And my aunt, trying to be a good Baptist, said, yes, I did. She said, you know, I don't figure it'll do anything, but according to your grandmother, which was her mother, she said, according to your grandmother, everybody you pray for gets healed. She said, so I said to her, well, will he pray for me? Would you ask him to anoint me with oil and pray for me? And I said, you know what, Faith? I said, you've just exercised. I said, you just exercised enough faith to receive a miracle. And then she started talking back, just, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. and I began to say, Oh, the devil is a liar, and he might as well move on. The devil is a liar, and he might as well move on. The devil is a liar, and he might as well move on. God's truth is marching on. And then my faith started talking more crap. And I begin to sing, Oh, the devil is a liar, and he might as well move on. The devil is a liar, and he might as well move on. The devil is a liar, and he might as well move on. God's truth is marching on. Faith looked at me and said, well, go ahead and anoint with all the praise. She said, I'm sick of hearing you sing. I wasn't going to let her sit there and ruin her miracle by talking a bunch of negativity and foolishness. So I kept interrupting her. Oh, I'm going to tell you, folks. When I tell you this old preacher's old-time Pentecost, there are times I do things may seem crazy as a loon to you, but they work. I anointed Faye with all and prayed. 
When I got done praying, I said, Faith, you're going to have this baby. I said, how far gone were you? She said, I think she said, three months. I said, then in six months is when you're due. She said, yes. I said, you're going to have this baby in six months. And Faye literally said to me, well, but I've already begun to pass tissue, and I've already begun to pass these things which indicate the baby itself was coming out of her. I said, let me tell you something, girl. The same God who created you created that womb. The same God that created you and created that womb created that fetus and he is able to restore that fetus in your womb six months from now you're gonna have that baby she continued having pain all night long the next morning she woke up and she was painless she went back to the doctors and the doctor said the fetus is fine. Six months later, she had that baby. Several years later, after she had divorced and remarried, remarried she married a fellow who was quite a bit her senior. She said, well, I figured at his age, I didn't have to worry about pregnancy. She was 40, 41 years old, something like that herself. She got pregnant again in her early 40s. The doctor said, this isn't a good time for you to be trying to have a baby at this point in your life. You know, you're up in age, you've had a history of, of miscarriages and all that. She said, well... That's just tough because I don't believe in abortion and I'm not going to end the pregnancy so we'll just have to let this thing play out. Guess what happened? She had that child without a minute's trouble. She had her fifth baby without so much as a glitch. Hallelujah. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because when God does it, He does it right. Hallelujah. And when she had that fifth baby, I made sure I told her. I said, boy, Faye, when God heals you, he heals you good, don't he? Hallelujah. You got pregnant in your 40s and had your fifth baby without a single problem in the world. Oh, I want to tell you today, people, you've got to be careful about putting God in a box. You've got to be careful about anticipating the Lord's answering your prayer one way and not being open to the reality that he may very well answer your prayer from a completely different angle. Many people lose out on great miracles simply because they cannot recognize when the Lord has genuinely shown up. If things don't happen the way they expected or the way they anticipated they would happen, they will not accept the miracle even though it is standing right in front of them. This man did not recognize the miracle in front of him because he was so busy looking at the water. He was so worried about how he might possibly get into the water when the water was troubled that he didn't understand Jesus is the miracle worker. The reason the water heals is because Jesus heals. Hallelujah. And you see, he could have lost out on his miracle. But thanks be to God, God is sovereign. And the Lord was able to say, you know what, this man's got the faith to believe that if he gets in the water, he'll be healed. And I'm going to honor that faith and heal him now. Hallelujah. Rise up and walk. Oh, I want to tell you today, it may not always be as you expected. In John, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 9 through 14, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. 
Naaman was a leper. But Naaman was wroth, he was angry. And he went away and said, Behold, I fought. Listen, Naaman said, Behold, I fought. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith unto thee, Wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Naaman nearly missed out on his healing, because he had a preconceived idea as to how his meeting with the prophet would go. But nothing happened the way that Naaman expected it would. Oh, but when he did what the man of God had instructed him to do, hallelujah, he got what he had come for. Oh, children, don't let your preconceived notion, don't let your expectation ruin your miracle. Don't let your expectation rob you of your healing. Don't let your expectation rob you of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Don't expect that God is going to do things one way and not be open to the possibility that He's going to do it, but He's going to do it in a way that you never expected. Hallelujah. Sometimes our blessing or the miracle that we're waiting on hinges more upon trust then it does faith. We know the Lord can do things. We may even believe He will do things. But if we attach expectations as to how He'll do it, we may miss out altogether. Children, the Lord not only asks us to believe Him, but He also asks us to trust Him. What do I mean by that again? Let me explain. Not only does He ask us to believe Him, but He asks us to trust Him. He says, believe that I'm able. Do you believe that I'm able? Oh Lord, I know you're able. Do you believe I'm willing? Oh Lord, I know you're willing. Can you trust me to do it my way? If I don't heal you right this minute, if I make you have to live with that for a few years. Can you still trust me? Mm. Mm. Now, Lord, wait a minute. I thought all miracles came instantly. Then you don't know your Bible. I thought all miracles were instantaneous. I thought that everything, when God answers prayer, when God does things, He always does it immediately. Oh, no, 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 honey. No, no. <laughs> You need to read your Bible. You need to read your Bible. Not only does God call us to believe Him, but He calls us to trust Him. Let me decide how I will deliver this miracle to you. Let me decide how I will deliver this blessing to you. Let me decide how I will deliver you. Let me decide how I will heal you. Let me decide how I will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Don't get ideas in your head as to how I'll do it. Just trust me and let me do it. Oh, hallelujah. 
In Acts 3 verses 1 through 9, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Now listen to the next phrase. Verse 5. And he gave heed unto them. Listen expecting to receive something of them. This is the key to this man's miracle. He didn't just look at Peter and John to hear what their next sentence was, to hear what they were going to say next. No. He looked at them, and he looked at them with expectation. Okay, these guys are going to give me something. They're going to do something for me. They're going to help me in some way. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But he did not know what these men were going to do. He just was expecting something. <laughs> The word of the Lord says, Acts chapter 3. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Oh, I'm here to tell you today, it pays to look upward expecting, listen to me children, to receive something. But it pays not to expect something specific or to expect it in a certain way. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You don't know what way God's going to come at you. You don't know what way God's going to answer your prayer. You don't know whether the water's going to be troubled. And some man is going to lift you up and throw you in the pool? Or whether Jesus is going to walk by and take care of the matter himself? Hallelujah! I'm here to tell you today, it is not at all as I expected. There are times when I'm driving Tommy and I somewhere for dinner and he'll ask me, so where are we going? I'll simply answer, don't worry about it, trust me. I then take him somewhere new that I have learned about or someone online may have recommended. And knowing him as I do, I'm confident that he'll love this particular restaurant. He usually does. You see, you don't just have to believe that I know how to operate an automobile. You have to trust me to get us somewhere that you'll fully enjoy. Amen. You follow what I'm telling you? So faith is one thing, but trust is another. That's why when miracles don't come instantaneously, that's why when the Lord allows us sometimes to have to live with sickness, to live with disease, to live with struggle, to live with an infirmity, to live with... Uh, even sometimes issues of addiction or issues of bondage. Say, Lord, why aren't you delivering me from this yet? Because he's trying to help you develop trust. Trust me. You believe I can do this, don't you? Trust me. Let me do it. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes if there's anything I've learned 
going through some of the things I've gone through in my life, and I've been through some tough stuff, folks. I've learned that sometimes I believe God, especially when it comes to healing and things of that nature, I believe the Lord lets it linger and lets it sometimes even worsen because He is waiting for a moment to do the miracle that is going to literally just throw scientists and doctors right off their seat. When I came out of the hospital in 2000, after experiencing double pneumonia and a parasite in my intestine, and the doctors had no anticipation in the universe that I would live, they literally said three doctors that were supposed to be very, very renowned, very well-known doctors that came in to me at the hospital in the end to talk to me. And they said the reason they were doing this, this is what the doctors told me. They said the reason we're here is because you have defied every single thing that is taught in medical textbooks. And actually I'm wrong, it was a different occasion. Another experience I went through uh, where I had uh, my liver and what have you, was ready to die on me. And uh, that's when it was, because my, my levels of toxins in my blood were so high that my doctor told me, he said, if I were to take this much blood out of your body right now and pump it into an elephant, he said, an elephant would drop dead. He said, that's how high the toxins are in your blood. He said, I cannot for the life of me figure out how it is that you're sitting here talking to me right now. I'm here to tell you folks, if God makes you wait on your miracle, maybe He's trying to wait for an opportunity. Maybe He's got it timed in such a fashion so that when it happens, only an idiot, only a fool would deny that it was God. Maybe He's trying to use you as a testimony to a specific doctor or to a specific nurse. Maybe what you go through in the end is going to wind up being what brings somebody to Christ. You see, this is why the Word of God said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You've got to be willing to let God do with your body what God will, so that in the end He can bring glory unto Himself. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? This is where the Pentecostal movement is messed up miserably. We've had preachers running around telling people, bless God! God heals you, it's instant. And when God's going to heal you, He's either going to heal you or He ain't. Maybe you're not being healed because you've done something wrong. Maybe you're not being healed because blah, 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 blah. And what they wind up doing is they wind up preaching these people who need a miracle right out of their miracle because they expect and anticipate a very specific act of God. And when God doesn't act that way and it's not at all as they expected, like Naaman, they go away angry. They go away depressed. They go away upset. They go away disappointed. And they wind up dying and yielding themselves to the sickness or the disease. Is that because God had no interest in healing them? No. No, it's because they didn't trust God. Hallelujah. They may have believed God, but they didn't trust God. They didn't let the Lord come to them whatever way. Lord, I'm going to tell you today, whatever way you want to come at me, come at me. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter to me how you do it. Just get it done. Hallelujah. A lot of people are watching today. A lot of people who are not watching today will watch later. And you need a miracle. You need a healing. Oh, my God.
I know for a fact that what I'm saying right now is absolute fact. Somebody's watching this or going to watch it and you need a miracle so bad. You need a blessing so that you've been praying for the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost ain't come. You've been praying for healing and healing hasn't yet come. You've been praying for deliverance and deliverance hasn't yet come. And the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you right now, trust me. You see, believing God isn't about believing Him for this instant so you can receive your miracle. It's about believing Him through the time that you have to wait. Can you keep believing Him? If you don't see what you want to see, if you don't see what you're expecting to see, if it doesn't happen or if it doesn't come the way you expect it to happen or the way you expect it to come, can you still believe me, the Lord says? Can you still trust me? Can you know that I know what I'm doing and what I'm doing, I'm doing for a very specific purpose. There are times when miracles, I'm trying to close up today, there are times when miracles come with conditions. The Lord may require an act of faith prior to His granting our request. We read in the Word of God in Luke 17, 11 through 14, And it came to pass as He, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Sometimes our miracle has a condition attached to it. That condition requires that we act in faith. We have to be able to trust the Lord. If the Lord says, do this, people say, brother... You're going through all kind of illness and sickness and trouble in your body, and yet you're talking about if God opens a door for Tommy for a job in another city, that you're going to start a new work in that city. You better believe I am. Hallelujah. Because nothing ever been accomplished when God's people don't act in faith. We don't have people in church today who ought to be in church today because they haven't got enough faith to fill a thimble. Well, bless God, I don't, get, I don't make a lot of money and I can't afford the gas to drive to church. I can't afford to pay for the gas to get there. Well, honey, um, where in the world is your faith? I'll tell you where it's at. It's absent. It's non-existent. If you can't believe God to provide for you so you can have the gasoline to do what He has called you to do and to be part of a body and to be part of a ministry and to help hold the preacher up so that a work of God can be done. If you can't believe God for that, then God help you if you ever have to face anything more serious. Sometimes miracles come with conditions. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Always looking to blame somebody. Jesus answered, listen, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, listen, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. 
When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. By the way, sent is also a definition for the word apostle. Hallelujah. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. His miracle had a condition. The Lord didn't say, now go home and wash this mud out of your eyes, did he? No. He gave him specific instructions. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. The prophet didn't tell Naaman, go to the nearest river and dip seven times. No. He said, go to the Jordan River. You know what the problem with the Jordan River was? There was no river in all of Israel that was muddier and dirtier than the Jordan River. It was a filthy river. You ever drive by a river or go over, Tommy and I were traveling, you know, we went over some spots and they call this such and such river. And you look down and the water is just brown and mucky, you know, and dirty. It's got a lot of silt in it and stuff. It's carrying that down to the ocean. That's what the Jordan River is. It's filthy. It's dirty. Naaman said, aren't there better rivers? But listen, when God gives you a condition, you better do exactly what the Lord has said tell you, a lot of people lose out on miracles and blessings in their life. Listen to me now. I know what I'm talking about because God speaks to them and says, I want you in this church. But they will not do what is necessary to be in that church. When God called me to Texas, I know that God called me to Texas so that I could be uh, uh, come under the tutelage of Brother Gillum so that I could be part of the Riverside Church of God. That experience changed my life. It changed my walk with God. It changed my understanding of so many things. Folks, to this day, my preaching and my teaching and my ministry is affected positively by things I learned in that church. But if I had not obeyed God when I was 16 years old, and the Lord said, I want you to go to Texas. If I hadn't obeyed God, what would it be today? What would I be? What would my ministry look like? What would my teaching, my preaching look like if I hadn't obeyed God? Do you follow what I'm telling you? Oh, I want to tell you, God don't ever tell you to do nothing except that there's benefit in that for you. There are people that God has put in this church and they let their pride get in the way. They let their ego get in the way. They got their feelings hurt because of some little thing the preacher said. And they allowed that to drive them away. Honey, you don't recognize the devil when the devil comes at you. You don't recognize when the enemy is trying to rob you. If God put you here, God put you here for a reason. And his brother Tatlock said to me, has he called you to preach? When did he tell you to stop? If God calls you to go to a church, you better not leave that church till he tells you another church to go to. Sometimes miracles come with conditions. Lastly this afternoon, because I'm running out of time, we read in 2 Kings 4 verses 1 through 7. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. 
So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay the debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Hallelujah. Children, God operates in and through faith. We often mistake fear or desperation or panic for faith. But at times, the Lord will ask us, to demonstrate our faith, to make clear that we are operating in faith. When we are clearly coming to Him from a place of faith to begin with, it generally is not necessary for Him to ask us to demonstrate our faith. But if we come to Him first out of fear or desperation or panic, then it may be needful for the Lord to say, you know what, for me to do this for you, I need you to do this first. Why? What value is there in, in, in doing that? What value was there in the Lord putting mud on this man's eyes and telling him to go wash in the pool of Siloam? The value was in the man's obedience as an act of faith. He was demonstrating his faith. I trust you, Lord. I trust you know what you're doing. I trust that if you're telling me to do this, there must be some good reason in it. Hallelujah. And he obeyed the Lord and he received his miracle. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, children, there have been many times in my life when I have received from God miracles and blessings. And they arrived in a manner that was not at all as I expected. Matter of fact, there are times that God has simply blown my mind <laughs> by doing things in a way that just, I, I couldn't for the life of me, I would have never in a million years seen it come in that particular way. I've told you before, I'll tell you one last time, then I'm going to close this message up. As a pastor in my first church, my father, who I've told you was not a good man, had taken the only car I had away from me so he could sell it and profit from it. And here I was, the 19-year-old pastor of a new church, and all of a sudden I have no car. One of my church members, bless their hearts, Sue and Leo, came to me and said, Brother Morrow, we want to give you our car. We were going to trade it in for a new one, said, but what we'll do is we'll let you have our, our car, and then we'll just simply buy a new one without a trade-in. That took sacrifice on their part to do that. So I took their old Dodge Dart that they gave me, you know, and I drove it for several months, and then all at once the engine went on it. And my grandfather told me, my mother's dad, bless his heart, he said, I'll help you replace the engine. He even bought me an engine for the car. He said, I'll help you replace it. He said, I can't get under it and do the work myself, so I'm going to have to tell you what you need to do, but you and I together will get it done. So we were in the process of doing this. We were in the process of changing the engine in this old car. And I got a phone call, listen to me, at my grandparents' house. This is before cell phones, folks, way before cell phones. And so my grandmother said, CJ, there's somebody calling for you. And I took the phone, and this man said, you don't know me. He said, but I understand you need a car. And I said, well, um, yeah, I said, the engine blew on the car I've got. I said, I'm in the process of changing the engine now I said so I will have one after a little while he said but you don't have one right now do you I said no sir I don't he said uh, well I've got a car for you and it's yours if you want it 
And again, I, I didn't want to be selfish, you know, so I said to the man, I said, well, I'm going to, my car's being fixed. I said, it's going to be fixed shortly, you know, because I felt like, why in the world should I have two cars? You know, I'm going to have the other car fixed shortly. And he said, Pastor, if you want this car, all you have to do is say so, and it's yours. I said, okay. I said, well, all right, sure, I, I could use it. I said, where are you located at? He said, oh, I'm in, and I'll never forget, it was like Groton or New London or something. That was 90 minutes away from where I was. And he said, but all you need to do is tell me your address and I'll bring it to you. Tommy, I didn't even have to go pick up this car. The man and his wife, he, he, she followed him in another car. He drove it, dropped it off for me, a beautiful little Ford Pinto station wagon that I used to death. was wonderful when we had to bring groceries to people and help people with stuff. I lent that car out to members of my church when they needed a car and they didn't have a vehicle for various reasons. That car was an enormous blessing to us. But he drove it to me, handed me the key, signed the title over to me. Didn't owe a payment on it, not a penny. Didn't have to pay nothing. And he left. And my grandmother said, well, how do you know him? And I looked at her and I said, I don't. I said, I have no clue who, who that man is. I don't have the slightest idea in the universe who that man is. And to this day, I promise you, I have no clue who that man was. No clue in the universe. But I'm here to tell you today, when you have a need, when you need God to heal, when you need God to save, when you need God to restore you, when you need God to deliver you, when you need God to bless you, children, stop expecting God to do it your way. Stop expecting God to do it a specific way. And open yourself up to the possibility that while you're looking at the pool waiting for the water to be troubled, Jesus is going to show up. Hallelujah. And your miracle will arrive and you will say it came not at all as I expected. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?